fellow laborers. You know, there's one thing that you can learn from a lazy person. That's how to be poor. God expects his children to labor, and not only in a physical sense, but as a spiritual as well, as we're going to cover today. But he promises blessings and prosperity to those who are willing to work. Those who will not work can expect a life of poverty and want. On a spiritual level, God expects his children to labor to produce fruit for him. There are all too many of our brothers and sisters who are lost in this world of darkness. And we should, do, that's where we come in. That's our jobs, is to bring the word of God, the light of the world, Jesus Christ, to those who are lost in this world of darkness. And, you know, we should do it with a sense of urgency. Time is growing very short. Watch the news if you don't think that I'm, I'm, I'm factual in that time is growing short. Things are happening, uh, and I hope you, you are watching. That's what our, what we're, another thing we're supposed to do is be watchmen, but go about it with a sense of urgency. Open your Bibles this morning to Proverbs uh, chapter 14. We're just going to cover one verse there, but you know what? Solomon could say a lot in one verse. The Proverbs are a group of comparisons by Solomon. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this morning as we begin our lecture with Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to Penury. Penury means pennilessness or, or poverty. In other words, if you work, you're going to profit, whether it's physical or spiritual. You're going to bring benefit. On the other hand, mere talk, we could add, of the lips brings nothing but poverty. Have you ever noticed that talkers, and we're not talking about people who communicate. We all talk, obviously, but I'm talking about people who talk instead of work. They tend to be procrastinators. They always have a good reason not to do things today. Tomorrow is soon enough, but you know what? Tomorrow never comes with a procrastinator. I said earlier that one thing you can learn from a lazy person is how to be poor. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 24, verse 30 with me. Proverbs 24, verse 30, and it reads, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. I went by the other day this lazy man's place. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles, had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Everything was in disrepair. This made me think the other day one of the guys that works at the chapel has a, a, a young daughter, about three or four years old, and they were driving into town the other day, and she looked at these fields that were grown up, and she said, Daddy, these people don't mow their lawn as nice as you keep your lawn. <laughs> and he told her, he said, Honey, those are hay fields. They, they, they don't cut those like that. But that's made me think of this verse. Verse 32. Then I saw and considered it well, I looked upon it and received instruction. I learned something when I went by that lazy man's place and I saw that it was all in disrepair. Verse 33, what did he learn? This is what the lazy person says. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. I'm, I'm so tired. Tired. 
I, I can't do any of my chores today. I, I'm, I think I'll just take a nap and, and sleep. Verse 34, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, traveleth, I should say, and thy want as an armed man. I like the way Moffat translates this last verse. Moffat translates verse 34, your poverty will pounce upon you and your want will overpower you. You know, there are a lot of God's children who are standing around idle. They, they've got their hands folded and, and they're sleeping. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. This is a very deep chapter, Matthew 20. The, the subject is God's children working in the world, but it goes all the way back to the first earth age. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like. You want to know what the kingdom of heaven is like? Well, Jesus is about to tell us. Unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. The vineyard is the world. And early in the morning, this could go all the way back to the first earth age. And you know what? You are the laborers from that first earth age, God's elect. He chose you because you stood with him in a very special way against Satan. You're going to stand with him again against the Antichrist. As the, the previous chapter ends, many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. Verse 2. And when he, this is the householder, God, in other words, symbolic of God, had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Again, the vineyard is the world. And he agreed with them, your, your wages for the day are going to be one penny. And he went out about the third hour, this is 9 a.m., and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. There are many today standing idle with their hands folded, a little sleep, a little slumber. I'll put it off until tomorrow. Verse 4, And said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. And what he's going to give them is the same as he gave those who started early in the morning. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. He went back out at noon and 3 p.m. and saw others standing idly by with their, their hands folded, standing idly by, doing nothing. He hired them and put them to work in his vineyard. And about the eleventh hour, this is 5 p.m. I mean, that's a short day for some. He went out and found others standing idle, not producing fruit, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? You know, that's a good question for us today. If you are standing there idle, why are you standing idle? What are you doing for the Lord? What, what are you producing for Him? And I don't want anybody to get on a guilt trip. You know, anyone that's involved with a ministry that teaches God's Word has good works. You, you, you that support a ministry that teaches God's Word, you have a feather in your cap with your Heavenly Father. He doesn't consider you one who stands about idly with your hands folded. Verse 7, they say unto him, because no man hath hired us. No one's taught us how to be productive for the Lord. No one's taught us the word of God. He saith unto them, go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. And God always does what is right. So when even was come, the day was over, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, to his pay clerk, it's time to settle up. 
Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. Again, some chosen in the first earth age. Jeremiah, for example. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. God told Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. God knew you in the first earth age as well. And when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, those that started the day at 5 p.m., they received every man a penny. They, they all earned the same thing regardless of how long they labored for the Lord. But when the first came, those who started early in the morning, they supposed or expected that they should have received more and they likewise received every man a penny. Now that's what they agreed to with the, the, the owner of the property, with the Lord. A penny was going to be their hire. Now they're going to grumble and complain about it. See that you're not one of those who grumble and complain. <clears throat> and when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house. Now think spiritually. I guess they would have rather that many of your brothers and sisters who found the way to salvation wouldn't have, no matter regardless. I guess they would have rather that some of their brothers and sisters would have gone to hell, would have gone into the lake of fire. Verse 12, saying, these last have wrought but one hour. And thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. We worked all day long out there in that heat. The sun was beating down on us, and we were sweating like you wouldn't believe. And you gave these who started at 5 o'clock, those who found the way to salvation at 5 o'clock, their reward is the same as our reward. Verse 13, but he answered one of them and said, friend, I do thee no wrong. And that's the truth. He's fair. He didn't do anyone wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? The answer to that is yes. Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee, just like the kingdom of God. That's what the verse 1 started out. This is what the kingdom of God is like. Those who started at the beginning of the day, the first earth age, and supported God, then get the same thing as those who convert in this, the second earth age. Those who started at 5 p.m., the 11th hour in the day. Verse 15, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? God doesn't play any favorites. He doesn't show any partiality. Everyone gets exactly what they deserve. Verse 16, so the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. You know, people who don't understand the three world ages haven't a clue what this verse means. What does he mean? The, the, the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Could you explain that if you didn't understand the three world ages? Probably not. Probably not. But the elect were justified in that first earth age. And they get the same thing as those who are converted in the last hour, the second age. And you know what? We should be happy for them. We should rejoice. The angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner converteth. Luke chapter 15, verse 10 will document that. All laborers are worthy of their hire. Turn over with me to Luke chapter 10 as we continue our study on fellow laborers. Luke chapter 10. Let 
I'm going to pick it up with verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face unto every city and place, whither he himself would come. In other words, every place he was about to go. And, and the ministry, the church, was growing. And, and beside the twelve disciples, God appointed, or Jesus appointed another seventy as sent ones. Apostles is what the word means. And it's interesting to note he sent them forth two by two as witnesses. And how many places if you had 70 people and they went by two by twos, how many places would they be capable of going to? 35, right? What's 35 in biblical numerics? It's hope. They were sent forth to bring hope to those who are lost in this world of darkness. Verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, and you, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers unto his harvest. Elect, you are the laborers of his harvest. The harvest is truly great but the laborers are few. Verse 3, Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. And you know, the shepherd is fully capable of knocking the wolves off of you. That song, the first one that we sang today, you know, Jesus is able to take care of his sheep. Don't ever forget that. He can knock the wolves off. Verse 4, Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes. Don't take any extra shoes. And salute no man by the way. You are on an urgent mission. Go about it with a sense of urgency. Don't stand around chit-chatting for an hour, wasting time. And into whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. In other words, is the Prince of Peace in this house? Jesus Christ, of course. Discern if there is peace in that home. And if the Son of Peace be there, if they're Christians, in other words, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. In other words, if you are received, teach them all that you are able to teach. That's, that's what we're supposed to do is teach the Word of God. Teach the laborers how they can produce fruit for God. Many don't have a clue. If you don't find the Prince of Peace, you don't find peace in that house though, don't stop there. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Verse 7. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Don't go from house to house with that scrip, which is a bag, a begging bag, if you will. Teach all that you're able to teach before you move on, is what this is saying. Verse 8. And into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. A servant is worthy of their hire. And heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. And is it the apostles who have the power to heal? Of course not. The power is in the name of Jesus Christ. We're given power over all of our enemies, even the wolves in the name of Jesus Christ. We're given the power to heal the sick as long as we do it in his name. Don't overlook this. The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. What does that mean? Jesus Christ is in you, right? Is he the kingdom of God? Of course, he's what brings you to the kingdom of God. So 
the, the, the Christ that's in you is what brings the kingdom of God nigh unto those who you would try and help. Verse 10, But unto whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same and say. To go out into the street is a way of saying to, to say this publicly. Even the very dust of your city, including the manure from the animals that use the streets, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be you sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. The kingdom of God came nigh unto them as well, but they rejected it. They wouldn't hear what you had to say. They wouldn't hear the word of God. Don't, again, cast your pearls before swine. Verse 12, But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. More tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah. What did God do to Sodom and Gomorrah? He destroyed it. And it's going to be more tolerable for them than the city who uh, rejects the word of God. Well, that's what the word says. You have many fellow laborers, but there is one that you would probably be surprised to call your fellow laborer. Turn with me as we continue to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter three, let's go with verse one. And I, brethren, and here he's speaking to the Corinthians, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. And, and in the previous chapter, Paul went to a great length talking about spiritual versus flesh. And what he's saying is, you know, even if I wanted to talk spiritual to you, I couldn't because you're still in flesh. He got angry with them in the previous, in chapter 1. Uh, the church of Corinthian, they, they, and Paul told them there, he said, you're, you're saying I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, which is Peter. And he goes on to say, was Paul crucified for your sins? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? He came down on them because they're, they're getting off in their little denominations. Their little, uh, I'm a, a follower of Paul. I'm a follower of Apollos. Who should we be followers of? Jesus Christ. Don't worship men. This man or any other man. Verse 2. Paul continues. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. I, I wanted to teach you about the three world ages. But you're into the same salvation message every Sunday. You go to church and you sit in a pew and you listen to that same salvation message over and over and over when there's so much more to God's word than that. But Paul's saying, I couldn't go there with you because you're still in the milk. Verse 3, for ye are yet carnal. That means you're thinking flesh. For whereas there is among you envying and strife, and divisions, denominations, for example. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? Put your spiritual man in charge of your flesh man. Flesh brings envying and strife. Verse 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Again, we should all be of Jesus Christ, not of Paul, not of Apollos, not of Cephas. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, 
even as the Lord gave to every man. Paul and Apollos were simply ministers that were bringing the word of God. It wasn't a new word. It wasn't, certainly wasn't the word of Paul or the word of Apollos. It was the word of God. Again, don't worship men. Verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Always give God the credit. You know, he gives gifts to teachers. He gives gifts of, of helping the poor. He gives gifts of, of healing. He gives gifts, numerous gifts to people. But don't ever take credit for the gifts that he gives. Give him credit. He's the one that gave the gift. But Paul's saying here, you know, I've planted seeds and Apollos has come along and watered them. But the increase is God's. So then neither is he that planteth anything. In other words, he that planteth isn't anything special. Neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Man is nothing without God's gifts. The reason we came here in verse 8, or verse 9 here in a minute. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. We are one body, one body of Christ. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And you know, whether God says that's a penny, if he says that's a penny, that's good enough with me. You know, working for the Lord, we should pay to be able to do that, I think. Why? Because we get rewards. We get benefits when we produce fruit for Him. That's the only way you're going to get blessings from your Heavenly Father is to produce fruit for Him. Now the reason we came here, verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Think about that. We are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. This means you're God's farmers. You plant the seeds. You are God's building. Verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I, this is Paul speaking, have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. And of course the foundation that we build on, Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. You build on any other foundation, uh, it's like building on the sand. Your house is going to fall. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. His teaching is sound doctrine. That's what you build upon, is sound doctrine. Now if any man build upon this foundation, Christ, Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. And now this is you know, being compared to your works, your labor for God. Every man's work shall be made manifest, shall be made known. For the day shall declare it, judgment day will declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Ask, how are you doing, friend? God is a consuming fire. On judgment day, each and every one of us is going to take our turn standing before that consuming fire, our Heavenly Father. Are your works gold or are your works straw? Fire refines gold. Fire destroys straw. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, uh, he shall receive a reward. In other words, those whose works are gold, silver, precious stones survive. The straw doesn't. If any man's work shall be burned, that means the wood, the hay, or the stubble, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved Yet uh, so as by fire, singed but saved, I like to say. In conclusion, turn with me to Second Thessalonians. God doesn't care for 
able-bodied people who aren't willing to work, aren't willing to labor. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm going to pick it up with verse 1. <clears throat> Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. This verse tells us a lot about Brother Paul. Did Paul say, pray for me because of all the tribulations I've been through? Shipwrecked, beaten, pray for me. No, he didn't say pray for Paul. Pray that the word of God goes forth. That word that changes lives for the better. Verse 2, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable, in the Greek this word is absurd, and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Not everyone is a believer. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. He'll, he'll strengthen you. He'll, he'll let you be anchored in the word of God. He'll give you power over all of your enemies, all evil. Moffat translates evil in verse 3, the evil one. And of course, that's Satan. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And of course, Paul, what did he command? Did he tell them to do the words of Paul or Apollos or Cephas? No, he told them to do the word of God. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. You want to patiently wait for Christ. Many, unfortunately, are going to be spiritually in bed with the Antichrist when Christ returns. Don't fall for the fake. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. In other words, those who are after the traditions of men, separate yourselves from them. Uh, to be disorderly means unarranged or uh, could also be uh, that they're in, in the absurd, like we had in the previous verse, verse 7. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. You ought to imitate us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. We set the example for you to follow. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. No free rides. And you know, Paul, it's written in Acts chapter 18. Paul didn't expect a free ride. He was a tent maker by trade. He worked in addition to what he did for the Lord, making a living. So he didn't have to ask for people to give him bread. He earned his way. Not because we have not power or the, the authority or the freedom, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. Worky, workers are worthy of their hire, we covered in a previous scripture. But Paul's saying, I didn't want to be accountable to any man. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. And that's a sound principle. Anyone who is an able-bodied person and they're not willing to work, if you give them of yours, you're likely enabling them to, to be into something that they shouldn't be. Drugs, alcohol, for example. Verse 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies, always meddling in other people's business, always trying to figure out how to get in your pocket so that they don't have to work. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ 
that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Again, don't give them yours. Verse 13, but ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. You know what? Just because someone cheats you, maybe, out of something, does that mean that you should stop doing good things, period, altogether? No. We, sh we should do good things for people. And yeah, the, the, the person who burned you, the, the person that deceived you, are they going to get what they've got coming? God's going to make sure of it. You can, you can take that to the bank. So when we do something nice for somebody and it blows up in our face, don't stop doing nice things for everyone because one person deceived you and was crooked. Verse 14, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, by this letter, Note that man or mark that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Sometimes shame is a good motivator, a motivator for someone to go to work. Verse 15, yet count or think him not as an enemy, an adversary, but admonish him as a brother. Warn him as a brother. Te teach him God's word so that maybe he'll start doing good things for other people as you tried to do to him. The harvest is truly great. The laborers are few, beloved. 7,000 by last count. But that's our job in this time is to reach out to others, to teach them the, God, the Word of God. You know, if people don't know the Word of God, they cannot produce fruit for God. That's where we come in. We, we, we increase the fellow laborers in the harvest by teaching God's Word so that they're capable of producing fruit. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your written word, Father. Your word that uh, tells us how to be productive for you, Father. You have a group here, Father, that does want to serve you, Father. Uh, continue to open our ears, uh, open our eyes, Father. Reveal your will to us, Father. We want to do your will, not our own. Be with us the rest of this day, Father. Let everything that we do be a reflection of the love of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And paraphrasing that scripture, the teachings of Paul tells us that once we come to knowledge, in other words, once we believe and we're saved, that if we fall short, that you don't need to be saved again. That would be like crucifying Jesus again. And once was enough, uh, the crucifixion on the cross. So what do we do? And as it states in uh, Hebrews 6.6, 6, you repent. And that's the beauty of Christianity is that we have repentance. We don't have to go out and sacrifice animals to obtain atonement or coverage for our sins. Uh, we claim the blood of Jesus Christ uh, on the cross. He took our place just like the animals who were sacrificed in the time of Leviticus took the place of the offerer. 
<clears throat> so repent, and that's what we do. Joyce in Missouri, what would happen to a person who receives the mark involuntarily, like if you have some kind of surgery and they implant something in you, uh, mark put on you while you are out, in other words, drugged, I guess, or under anesthesia. Well, you don't know what the mark of the beast is. It's obvious choice. Uh, the mark is in your mind. When it says in your forehead, what's behind your forehead? Your mind, your brain. And that's where the mark of the beast is. It's a deception, if you will. It's believing that the Antichrist is Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of people who are going to be deceived. The mark of the beast is not uh, something that can be implanted in your skin or in your body, such as a computer chip, for example. Uh, I'd say, Joyce, you obviously haven't ordered our free introductory offer, the mark of the beast. Uh, the CD's free, the phone call's free. We don't even ask you to pay for the postage. Uh, it's all free, and it's important that you know what the mark of the beast is. That's the reason we offer uh, the one-time per household free introductory offer, the mark of the beast. <clears throat> Don from Virginia, do you think the Brexit issue could be a type for the beast? Well, uh, many think that Brexit is possibly the, and of course those of you who don't know Brexit is that Britain voted to leave the European Union, and that's the term Brexit comes from that. Uh, many believe that Brexit is possibly the deadly wound. You know, the one world system, in my opinion, is not developed to the point that it could receive a deadly wound at this point in time. But we are watchmen and we are to watch. Uh, Any time that you see an event such as the vote in Britain have a ripple effect around the world such as it did, uh, affecting stock markets, uh, uh, economies, etc. Uh, in my opinion, the deadly wound will eventually be uh, financial, and, uh, but I don't think the system is developed enough to receive the deadly wound at this point in time. But things are progressing that way, so uh, keep your eyes on what's going on. Good thought. Susan in Virginia, is it okay to have guns in your home? Well, that depends on where you live. Uh, uh, I, for one, would not would choose to live in a place that only criminals have guns, and that's what happens when you outlaw guns, only the criminals will have them. If you're going to purchase a gun, you need to, and it's quite all right to protect your home, you want to know the laws where you live as far as what rights do you have, where is the line. Uh, of, of where you're allowed to use a firearm or use deadly force against someone who intrudes into your home. Uh, some states have it where you have basically have to run out the back door to try and avoid the criminal. Uh, I don't think I'd choose to lose, live in a state like that either. Uh, some states, uh, the criminal has to be in your home uh, not outside your home looking in a window. So you need to know what the laws are in your particular state. But if you are going to, to purchase a firearm, uh, I strongly encourage people who weren't raised around guns, such as I was, that you take a training course. Uh, that way you can learn how to handle the gun safely, uh, where you don't shoot yourself or one of your kids. Uh, but know uh, the laws concerning what's legal, uh, to, where it's legal to use deadly force and where it's not. Nothing wrong with protecting your home. We, we're not second class citizens as Christians. We have a right to protect ourselves. 
And if the enemy is bigger and badder than you are, you need an equalizer such as Mr. Colt and Mr. Wesson. Oh, let's see here. We got Bob in Colorado. Since the sons of oil, the two witnesses were supernatural, how was Satan able to kill them unless their transfigured bodies were transfigured back to flesh on earth? I didn't think Satan had the power to kill one of God's people. Okay, Revelation uh, chapter 11, verses 3 uh, and the following verses, the two witnesses will have extraordinary powers. God gives them those powers. They're not their power, though. They're not supernatural beings. They're in the flesh. Uh, and, you know, the two witnesses will be slain in the pata, as it's written in the Greek language, an open area, and they will rise. I look forward to that time because that's when Jesus, as the two witnesses ascend, Jesus descends, coming back to earth. We're not flying away to him. He's coming back to earth. And, you know, the death of the flesh is really insignificant. It is the death of the soul that people should be most worried about. Gregory in Georgia, where can I find Melchizedek in the Bible? Okay, Genesis uh, chapter 14, verse 18 uh, tells us about when Melchizedek uh, met Abraham and took tithes of him. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 7, uh, verse 1 and the following verses in the New Testament. And what does Melchizedek mean? Uh, Melka in the Hebrew language is king. Zedek, a form of the word many of you are familiar with. Zadok, which are God's election. The king of God's elect is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you know, it's written in John chapter 8, uh, verse 56. Jesus told uh, them that were there, your father... Uh, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And that threw them for a loop. They said, you're not even 50 years old yet. And how can you say you've seen Father Abraham? And Jesus answered them, before Abraham was, I am. And of course, he was referring to when he met Abraham in the way in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. Dave in California, where does it say that fungi is unclean as in mushrooms? All right, well, Genesis chapter 1 verse 29 uh, states that God gave man every herb bearing seed for food. Mushrooms don't have seeds. Uh, mushrooms have spores and that is how they reproduce. So. Uh, if you're following to the letter of God's law, uh, only herb that bears seed is for man to eat. Antonio from Illinois. Uh, what is a mamzar? Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 2, the word as it's translated into the English is bastard. And... Uh, the meaning is confused by most people. Most people think a bastard is a child who is born out of wedlock. That's not what a bastard is at all. Check it out in your Strong's Concordance. Mamzar in your Strong's Concordance is a mongrel. And then they give a, a example of someone who is born of an, an Israelitish father and a heathen mother, or vice versa. It could be an Israelite woman and a heathen father. That's what a bastard is. Stan from Pennsylvania, question for Dennis. Since Lucifer was from the beginning cast out of heaven by our Lord God Almighty to wander to and fro on the earth, when did he return to heaven? I believe excuse me, he returned to heaven when Jesus uh, told Satan, get the hints, get behind me, 
Where is Jesus now? He's in heaven, and Satan is still behind him. Uh, he will remain in heaven until uh, Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 7 come to pass, and that's when Michael and his army defeat Satan and his angels and cast them out onto earth. That's when Satan is here on earth in his role as Antichrist. He's going to be deceiving many. <clears throat> Pastor Dennis, I've been studying 13 years with the chapel. I love it. Now my 20-year-old daughter is also studying with the chapel. Praise God. She and I belong to your church. We're still working on her brother. Pray for him and us, please. He's 21 and a half years old. Well, we'll everything on God's time frame, uh, I'll, bet, I'll bet he'll come around if you raised him up in the Word. Question, I must know, please, when and where is the wedding between Christ and his true church? Well, it's... You, know, you can read about it in Revelation uh, chapter 19 uh, and also Isaiah chapter 62 verses 4 and 5 where his bride is named uh, Hephzibah, which means uh, my delight is in her. Uh, Revelation 19 uh, goes into a little more detail. Are any battles at the end physical, especially between God and the evil world. No, uh, once Jesus returns at the seventh trump, uh, there is no more flesh, so there will be no more physical wars after that point in time. Uh, there will be spiritual wars, though Armageddon and Haman Gog, uh, you can rest assured, are going to come to pass. Millard in Pennsylvania, after Jesus was hung on the cross, he went to where uh, and taught the people before Noah were or were not saved by grace. And uh, this, just, I don't want to confuse people. What he's asking is Jesus uh, went to those who did not have the opportunity to believe upon him. In other words, those who lived under the law, not under grace. And where did he go? 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 17, 18, and 19. He went to those who were in prison. And you're, you're right, it goes all the way back to the time of Adam, I'm going to say even, that those who did not have a chance to uh, accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and be saved. He went to the other side of the gulf, in other words. Uh, the side where people who were not saved, which was the biggest part of mankind, uh, and he preached the gospel to them. And as it reads in 1 Peter chapter 4, many believed. Uh, Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1 also speaks of him going and being uh, with those who were in prison. Willie in Georgia, is a woman allowed to teach the gospel or prophesy? Absolutely. Uh, Miriam, the brother, or I should say sister of Moses and Aaron, was a prophetess. Uh, Deborah was not only a judge, she was a prophetess. Huldah was a prophetess. Uh, you, well, you say that's all in the Old Testament. I don't believe that's the case in the New Testament. Well, you're not familiar with Acts chapter 21, verse 9. Philip had four virgin daughters, and all four of them did prophesy. To prophesy can mean to teach as well. You know, that's all in the past, too. More importantly, you should be worried about the future, the current and future. And Acts chapter 2, verse 17, which is quoting Joel chapter 2, verse 28, makes it very clear that God's Spirit will be poured out on His sons and daughters, and they will prophesy. Carolyn in Texas is reading the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse in the Bible. Sure is. Uh, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 28, verse 10 and verse 13, line upon line, precept upon precept. Eli in Virginia, out of the 4,000 people, 
a gay person comes to me and says he wants to be saved, <clears throat> is it more important to feed the 4,000 people than to help the gay person? Does the gay person need to go to God first or can he come to me? Well, coming to you to be saved would not provide, bear much fruit because you, Eli, are not capable of saving anyone. It is our job to plant seeds. It is our job to hopefully lead people back to our Heavenly Father. And if a gay person came to you and asked, how do I do that? Hopefully, Eli, if you've been studying your Bible, you know what he needs to do to be saved. How about John chapter 3, verse 16? And Eli is not mentioned in John 3, 16, by the way. So uh, our job is to go to the lost and bring them back to the Father. Uh, the Elijah ministry, uh, Malachi, the last several verses of Malachi, the purpose, he said, I'll send Elijah to return the hearts of the children to the fathers, plural. There are two fathers, Satan and our Heavenly Father, God. And we're working to return the hearts of our lost brothers and sisters, whether they be gay or straight, to the Lord. So uh, and that's how I would answer that. I am out of time. I love you all a great deal for a special reason, and that is that you enjoy studying God's Word. You make time each day to talk with your Heavenly Father. You make time to read the letter that He wrote to you, the Bible. And you know, when you make his day, he's going to make yours. Blessings are sure to follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, though, beloved, you stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. And you know why? It's because Jesus, Yeshua, our Savior is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel. P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.